like to share my screen. Um, can you people see my screen? Yes, now we can see it, sir. Okay, so thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. This is the third part in preparing for greatness. And what we're looking here today is understanding effective preparation. So that's so today we are considering understanding effective preparation. And that's what we want to do just today. We'll just we'll look at some of the things that we need to learn and we'll build up from it next week. And our text by Grace is Proverbs 30, 24, 25. The ants are a people not strong yet. They prepare their food in the summer. So today we just want to look at this word, prepare their food in the summer. So Proverbs 6 says, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and the wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler provides. No, one of, I checked the Hebrew word for preparation. It also means to provide. It means to establish. It means to stand firm. So in this concept, we see prepare, prepare their food in some, the summer or provide her supplies in the summer. So you can actually use preparation and provision as the same. So I, I want to just try this evening to define preparation. The dictionary said to prepare is to get make or get something ready the key word for me there is ready and you know like i said last week there's something about preparing which is getting ready and after you finish then there's something about being ready now you are ready that preparation is when you've got into that state where you can say now i am ready for what the tomorrow holds what the opportunity holds so when you are in that process of you are still doing it, it's not really preparation. You've not completed it. It is when you get to that point. So I can say that the word preparation here is actually to live ready, to live in anticipation of the opportunities that your future holds, to live ready. Um, that's, that's the concept of preparation, to live ready. You are ready. Efficiency says having done all stand. Therefore, so that concept of I am standing, I have done all, is what preparation is. It's not when the enemy's onslaught comes that you start putting your breastplate of righteousness, buckle your feet with the gospel, shod with the preparation of feet or the uh, peace or the helmet of salvation. You must have put those things on before the onslaught of the enemy. So we need to go from, you understand, getting, getting ready to being ready. Now I am. I'm ready. So as I looked at that word, I am ready, I asked myself, how do you really know that you are ready? How do you know right now? If preparation goes beyond just the your, all the things you do, but you, you, you can say to yourself that I am ready. There's something about preparation that gives you confidence. There's something about preparation that gives you that assurance, that stamina. You know, it's like Hebrews, Hebrews, uh, 11 um, that talks about the concept of faith that he that comes to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, preparation is getting to that point where you have that assurance. I know I am ready. It's like a student. How do you know that the student is ready for an exam? How do you know that you are ready for your future? And I, as I ask myself that question, I think a student can only answer that question by looking at what are the standards expected and the work I have done. So based on the standard expected, uh, have, I, have I covered my syllabus? So in talking about preparation also, you need to ask yourself in whatever field of life, what are the standards expected? So if I want to play in a game of football today, the, the World Cup is ongoing. Argentina is playing Poland. We don't know who will win, Saudi Arabia and Mexico. Um, a game of football, yes, you need to prepare. Now, nah, this is the this is the this is the tournament. It can go for or against. I, I think I was told that Messi missed the penalty. In that game of football, there's the there's there's luck also in it. But if you do, if you won the hundred meter race. There are certain things in life that has fixed standard. And if in the 100 meter race, you've never run, you never all your life run below nine, 10 seconds, the chances of you winning an Olympic medal, you understand, as a man is rare. Because the standard for winning an Olympics is 100 meters is less than 10 seconds. 
So if you consistently run less than 10 seconds, you can say to yourself, I am ready, bearing no injuries and the rest. If you consistently run less than 10 seconds. So in the concept of preparation, the starting point has to be what are the standards expected? And the standards has nothing to do with you, it has to do with the examiner, has to do with life, has to do with the environment where you live. And based on the standards, what are the, the work I have done, would they meet this standard? Only when you can say, based on the standards expected and the work I have done will meet this standard, can you truly say that you are prepared? That is what it means. Only, only at that point can you fully say, based on what the future, the demands of the future. So put it this way, standards expected can also be the demands of the future. So if you have kids, for example, am I really ready for sending these kids to school? You understand, based on the expected demands. Am I ready looking at my salary, look at, looking at my cash flow? If there's a gap within expected standards and work done, it means you are not fully, fully prepared. So uh, let me just continue for time's sake. Uh, I, I want to talk about the truth test and I've explained it a bit here. I'll say to you, the truth test of preparation is what I call the time and chance test. Uh, Ecclesiastes says the race is not to the swift, the battle to the stronger. You know, birds to men that are wise, wisdom to men that bread to men that skillful, and the rest. Ecclesiastes is many level, but it ended by saying time and chance happens to them all. So whatever happens, your success is what you do with time and chance. So I say here that it is too late to prepare when the opportunity comes. So the true test of preparation is that ability to maximize time and chance. When that opportunity comes, you can maximize it. So the parable of the 10 virgins, we know that. And they were their time, you understand, so five did not have oil. Now, Bible scholars have gone into what the oil represents. I don't want to go into that debate. What does the oil represent? You understand? I don't want to go into the debate. But what we can all agree is that when the master came knocking, five of them were ready, ready to go into the next phase of their life. And five of them were nowhere to be found. That's the time and chance test. When life comes knocking, the question is, would you be found ready or would you be found one thing? And this ability to be found ready or one thing is a function of what you have done before time and chance happens. And so this is why I call the time and chance test. That's the only way to tell whether you're truly prepared. Everybody will say they are prepared until they write the exam. That exam is the time and chance test. That interview is the time and chance test, and that will tell whether you are prepared. Just said before Pharaoh was time and chance, but God had prepared him uh, with the different experiences that he has gone through to be ready for his time and chance. And when that time and chance came, Joseph passed the test. Same thing with David, with time and chance. Time and chance was seeing Goliath and Goliath taunting the children of Israel and they were all afraid. And David, David was already prepared because he had killed the lion and the bear. That's for me, the true test of preparation is the concept of the time and chance test. Now, when life gives you that opportunity, when life comes knocking at your door, when you, you stand, somebody gives you the referral and you stand before your pharaoh, when you, you come before your Goliath, would you be so confident, that assurance that I'm going to, I'm going to win? Would you go to the next phase from a prisoner to a prime minister? Would you follow the bridegroom to the, to the banquet or would your place be wanting? So the time and chance test, there's actually the true, true, true test of preparation. You know, you know, the Bible says that if you fail in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So the true, the true test of your strength is what happens when adversity comes. So adversity is, is that test to to determine your, your, your strength. For those of us in engineering, you know, they talk about the strength of a material. So you, you that tensile strength or what is called, it's, that's the true test of the strength of that material. For people who do cars, they need to do crash tests to see how strong that car can it withstand, what kind of damage can it withstand. So the true test of preparation is what you do when opportunity comes. Every time you miss an opportunity, it means that you were not ready, you were not prepared.
Maybe next week we'll talk about the benefits of preparation. One of them, I'll just put it here. And what I call it, I call it the concept of the missed calls. You know, sometimes you, maybe you are in the restroom, maybe you are downstairs, you are not with your phone, and somebody calls you and you did not, you look at, you were not with your phone on that call. And before you know, you've missed like five, six, and you didn't hear it ring. Then I know you can definitely return the call. But sometimes in life also, we miss certain opportunities simply because we are not ready we are not prepared and if you are not prepared not can i say this to you not even god because the parable of the virgin the bridegroom did not have a preference the bridegroom did not have a preference for any of the, any of any of the virgins the bridegroom did not have a preference but preparation was what opens the door to the next phase of their lives the question i want to ask you here is are you ready for the next phase of your life? So let me give you one example of preparation. Then I end with two qualities of people, two things you need to do in order to get started. And we can build it and we can take it off from here next week. I don't know. Can you can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, 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 okay, yes. you. Okay. Thank you. A perfect example is, I want to go back again to Joseph. Joseph standing before Pharaoh and interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. And he said to Pharaoh that there will be seven years of abundance. And after seven years of abundance will come seven years of famine. Yes. Then he now says, I want Pharaoh to do this. For me, let Pharaoh do this. So preparation is actually a verb. When you talk about prepared, let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land to collect, to collect one fifth. You know what happened? Let Pharaoh do this. So what you do in anticipation of a future that you know would surely happen is what preparation is. What you do in anticipation. So there are two things here. The first is a certain future. I know that famine would come. I know. Then the second is, so what I do today, right now, in, in anticipation of that future. You can go, and if you check all through scriptures, Noah was told about a flood, a certain future, and Noah was given the dimensions of the ark, and he started building the ark. In that assurance that there's a flood coming. So when you talk about preparation, there are two things. But before I go there, I say successful people secure the future by doing something in the present. I think it was my, my, smooth, my, my smooth dog that says that your future is hidden in your daily routine. So let Pharaoh do this. So they started gathering, started gathering. And for seven years, they were gathering against famine. No, I think almost a hundred years flood, building against a certain flood that would come and Noah was ready. When the flood came, Noah had an ark, but the other people did not have an ark, and that was why they perished. Um, Egypt saw the future and did something in the present to secure the future, and that was why Egypt had grain, and even Jacob, Jacob, a spiritual man in that case, did not have it because they did not see into the future. So preparation is something that has to do with securing the future. A future that would happen. For example, let's, let's keep living. We know if we keep living and if Jesus dies, you will be in your 70s. In your 70s, you understand, that future would happen. But when you enter your 70s, would you be comfortable? Would you be ready for the famine when your 70s come? That is what preparation is. Would you have an ark when the flood comes? That is what preparation is. If there's no ark, you understand. If there's no food provision you're in, 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 in famine, it means that you did not do something right in the preparatory phase. Because if you do something right in the preparatory phase, when the flood comes, there will be an act. If you do something right, when famine comes, there will be enough grain for you to survive, survive famine. That there will be enough grain for you to survive famine. In fact, can I, let me just, it just dropped in my spirit right now, and let me just say it here. I, I know a lot of us have not gotten to that point, but Joseph saved enough to survive. Egypt survived for seven years. 
we, in famine. And I, I think for us is to get to that point in our lives. I've not gotten there, so I can put this up front. But to get to that point in our lives where you can survive seven years of global famine, that is when you know that, wow, you are really, really prepared. Your financial future, seven years. I, I know some people say one day at a time, but at least the Bible gives us a reference that Joseph saved for seven years. So in the times of abundance, you save because you know that life is cyclical. So a businessman knows that business is doing well all well this period yes what do you do you say because you know it's cyclical there should be some months where businesses will not do well what is from the savings that you have that you can deal with the family so if you cannot survive seven years you should be able to survive seven months you understand if you cannot survive seven months you should be able to survive seven weeks if you cannot survive seven weeks at least start with seven days but I, I think everybody here, seven days is too small. The, the goal should be, I can survive seven weeks of famine. I can survive seven months of famine, and I can survive seven years. If you get to that point of surviving seven years, you know that, yes, you have really prepared for your financial future. Praise the Lord. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes you are. are. Yes, you are. Hey, Lord. Okay, so, I, I, and, and this is for me here. So in your daily routine, are you living with the consciousness of tomorrow or are you just living for the now? And that's, that's the question everybody needs to ask. So Egypt was not only a country that experienced abundance, but Egypt had a, a future outlook of their present day activities. What do I mean? They, they, they saw beyond the now. They saw into the future. Uh, that long-term view. And they saw it. And based on that, they said, we know that something is going to happen in the future. What must I do today to secure, to guarantee the future that we uh, that I know would definitely happen? So let me, let me end this so that because of time. I said, so preparation requires two things. The first thing it requires is foresight. Foresight is that ability to see into the future. Foresight is that ability to know that there will be seven years of famine. Foresight is knowing that there will be rain, a flood coming. That's what foresight is. So foresight deals with what the future holds, guaranteed. For some of us, it will be, it will be, it will be rain. For another person, it will be famine. For the ants, they know that winter is coming. That's foresight. Then they prepare their food in the summer. Because they know that during winter, they cannot work. So first sight is seeing into the future. First sight is knowing that I'm not getting younger. And 60s, you will hit 60s, you will hit 70. When you hit 60 and hit 70, would you be ready? So first sight is about that ability to see into the future. And we can talk about first sight from the business perspective, which is monitoring trends. So what future, what trends do you see happening in the next two to five years? Where do you see the world going? That is what foresight is. Big Gates, you might have one or two issues with Big Gates concerning some other things, but there are certain things you can't take away from him. And one of his quotes, which I, which for me, I have adopted, is that the, he said the, the secret of success is knowing where the world is going and being the first to get there. Now, what, what Bill Gates has simply said is simply this. Foresight, knowing where the world is going and being the first to get there is what I call daily discipline. So I, I, I know where the world is headed. I know, I know that there will be famine in seven years. So what do I do? In abundance, I save. It's a deliberate, deliberate action to save. I, I know that there will be flood coming. What do I do? I start building the ark. It's a deliberate. And, and I, I, why do I call it daily discipline? It takes, this in, in the terms of abundance, people want to squander. Just don't worry. The last year was good. This year is also fantastic, even better. Guys, which famine are you talking about? So wanting somebody, you understand that the famine is coming in the times of abundance, it's quite difficult for the person to believe. Wanting people that there's a flood is coming when they've not seen a flood before, it's quite difficult to convince. So Noah building an ark or Joseph forcing people to save, uh, it went against the conventional norm. It required year one, no famine, year two, no famine, year three, no famine. Year four, no famine. Year five, no famine. Year six, no famine. 
So for six years, it looked as if Joseph was confused. And I want you to imagine that Joseph was a stranger in Pharaoh's household. And he says, don't worry, year seven, there will be famine. Year one, there's no famine. Year two, there's no famine. Year three, there's no famine. And, and imagine what the other people in the palace might be saying and whispering. Imagine if year seven, the famine did not even show up. And, but Joseph was convinced and went one day saving and saving year six, year six and a half, year six, 11 months, and there still is no famine. But Joseph was still saving. And year seven, the famine started. Started gradually year seven. Now, the, the, the seven years of sacrifice, the seven years of daily discipline has now made sense. And, and this is what preparation requires. It's like the game, and when we talk about, when we talk about um, benefits of preparation next week, it's like, a, 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 like let me use the, 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 the um, Olympic again. The football is slightly different. The, you win the 100 meters less than 10 seconds, but it takes you four years of effective preparation for you to win that 100 meter race. And that daily discipline, that thing that the sacrifices that you've made. So I, I see a man that is preparing based on the things that he's doing right now. I see a man that is preparing. So I, I want to look at this. Let me see how many minutes I have. Okay. When we talk about the concept of vision, you see there are two, two prongs or two definitions of vision you understand that we need to understand. The first definition is the ability to see into the future. That's the first definition of vision. But you see, when you say where there's no vision, the people perish. If you check the literal translation, it's where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint and run wide. So vision is a restraining force. In fact, the concept of where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. That's the literal translation is the yoke, the yoke that you put upon the neck of an oxen. So vision is a restraining force. I know somebody that has a vision, not because of what he says about the future, but because of what he does in the present. So vision is not just about seeing into the future. Vision is also about maximizing the opportunities of the present. The daily discipline, write the vision, the scripture says, make it plain that he may run that reads it. So there is a part of running with a vision. The person that reads it runs with it. That's what vision is. The daily discipline. So preparation requires two things. One is foresight and number two is daily discipline. Next week I think I'll continue from here. You understand? Next week I'll continue from here but let me just put those two things together and end it, end it with another scripture that ties the two together. Foresight and daily discipline. Proverbs 22, verse 3, it says, a prudent man, a wise man, an intelligent man, whatever you want to call it, foresees evil. That's foresight. Foresees it. He sees it. He sees the future. He knows that, hey, there will be famine. He knows that, hey, my skills will not become relevant in the next five, ten years. I'm a consultant. I'm a business coach. I'm grateful that I, I, I speak to organizations, but I keep asking myself, natural at 60, would I still be doing this? Is this what I will be doing at 60? Foresight is asking yourself, at 60, is this what I, should, I will be doing with my life? Foresight foresees evil. And you know what it does? He hides himself. I, I want you to understand this. He hides himself simply means that maybe he takes a different pathway. And people will be wondering, why are you taking this pathway? He said, I foresee danger. Which danger? I bet, forget it. Why are you taking this path? Or why are you not going on this journey? I'm not going on this journey because I foresee evil. And some people will say, which foresee? You are too, you are too, you are too superstitious or whatever you want to call it. And the man hides himself. Hides himself when danger has not happened yet. Notice that he hides himself before the danger actually manifests. Because he foresees it. I see danger coming and, and he hides himself. That's, that's, what, that's what preparation is. So if you're not doing anything in the present to guarantee a future that you believe would happen, it simply means that you're not preparing. It simply means you're not preparing or you're not even preparing. If you're not doing anything in the present, if you're not hiding yourself Saving grain, building an ark, having enough oil for when the bridegroom comes, it simply means that you are not ready. 
And it says the simple will pass on and are punished. Why would they be punished? Is it because life, God wants them to be punished? No. Now, in this simple, it doesn't tell us whether they are believers or unbelievers. And it can happen to a believer. The simple, so he doesn't understand that, he didn't understand that danger was going to come. Or even though he understood it, he ignored the signs and went ahead. And guess what? It's punished. It's punished. So preparation requires two things fundamentally. Foresight and daily discipline. We'll take each one and break it and say, okay, how do you how do you know trends? How do you monitor trends? So from a spiritual standpoint, we know that uh, one way foresight can come through intuition. Intuition is God telling you about something deep in your spirit. You just know God revealing something to you, the witness of the spirit. You know that this journey you should not embark. That was what Paul said to them when they wanted to embark on that journey. He says, I perceive that this journey will be it will, it will come with a lot of danger and even a great hurt to ourselves and even the boat. And the people ignored Paul. That was exactly. And, and when they started the journey, everything went fine. I think it was seven days down the line that you were cried on came and they were caught. It, Paul did not have a control over the ship, but Paul perceived it. So sometimes foresight can come through that, that spiritual perception, insight, um, intuition, the witness of the spirit. You just know foresight, a prudent man foresees. So can I say this to you? Never embark on any major project without asking yourself, how will this project end? That's the key word of foresee. What's the end? What's the end? How would this project end? And if you don't know the end, then I'll say embark carefully. What I mean is that, yes, if you want to go into that business, don't, don't pump all the money so that you, even if, you, if the business doesn't work out the way you planned it, you will not make a major, major, major mistake. A prudent man foresees, foresees. Think about the future before you even go embark on the journey. And when you foresee evil, the second thing you need to do is to hide. To hide means you need to do something to guarantee a favorable outcome or do something to prevent an unfavorable outcome. So as I bring this to a close, outcomes are actually contingent on what we do in the present. The outcomes are all contingent on what we do in the present. The simple did not do anything. That's why scripture says, go to the slug, go to the ants, you slugger, learn of our ways. You know, now end up by saying a little sleep, a little slumber. So the, the ant is preparing to secure the future, but you're not doing anything in the present. It says your poverty will come as an armed man. God does not want to, God did not plan poverty for anyone, you understand? But the things that we do will guarantee whether we would hide from being punished or will be punished, whether we'll have abundance when others are in famine, whether we'll be saved in the earth when others are destroyed by the flood, is all a function of what are you doing in the present to secure a future that you know will happen. There are certain futures we know. I know that 10 years from today, my kids will be in university. It's a, it's a future that I know will happen. So what am I doing right now to guarantee 10 years from today when they're in university, do I have a, would, I, would I have enough to send them to university? That's the question. That's the question preparation preparation does. We ask questions about the future that we know would happen. Then we ask ourselves, second question, what must I do now? Now to either secure or abort. Secure a favorable future, abort an unfavorable future. On that note, I want to bring this to a close in... 9.31. Okay, I, I hope, I hope, I hope, I don't know. I hope you learned something this evening. Yes, we learned something. 